Welcome all once again to Lit Talks. It's been a long time. Hope you all are doing well. So today I talk to add to the literary theory and criticism series. The video is especially made for my semester five students who will be doing modernism with me. Now, unlike my earlier videos, this cannot be a very di- direct lecture kind of video because modernism is a slippery term with diverging aspects. traceable in its relation to history and at times untraceable where we can just assume or rationally think so in case you have any opinions or would like to differ or add anything you can always do through the comment section i hope by the end of this video you will have a fairly good idea about the foundational elements of modernism so with no further ado let's dive into today's topic i have titled it modernism 1 for few more videos on the topic are likely to follow Modern is a very cliche and everyday word, right? You see someone wearing a traditional de- dress, say dhoti and a turban, in your vocabulary he is not modern, and the moment you see someone in a stylish bermuda and a skin tight t-shirt with some bands around the wrist and tattoo turns done in the arms and the hand, you call him modern. Now let's think deep through history. Tattoos have a history. Tattooing spread among the upper classes all over Europe in the 19th century and it was not something that can be called European. The Wikipedia history of tattooing reads in the very first line tattooing has been practiced across the globe since at least neolithic times as evidenced by the mummified preserved skin ancient art and the archaeological record so it's primitive isn't it? <clears throat> then how is tattooing modern interesting right now to explain the intricacies i will divide the background into two parts the transition to modernity and immediate background and events when we read a period we roughly have a beginning year but modernism in spite of having been dated though with differing opinions of course is not as simple as it has been with the other literary periods I'd like to point here that the historians use the phrase early modern to refer to the 16th century and so you can well understand how wide is the remit of modernity in historical discourse and hence this division so let's begin with the transitional history three distinct points can be located in the transitional history which exemplifies modernity and the progress towards modernism number 1 shift from feudalism to capitalism as the organizing mode of economic and social life number 2 the enlightenment number 3 the french revolution and the year 1848 let's look into each of this one by one the shift from feudalism to capitalism which emerged in northwestern europe especially in great britain and the netherlands in the 16th to 17th centuries cannot be confined to some separate economic sphere but involves fundamental changes in all areas of human life some of these changes resonate within or shape the context of modernism this economic readjustment led to number a the migration of people from the country to the city from rural to urban ways of life which led to the accompanying development of towns and cities and also to the emergence of forms of human culture and consciousness specific to this secondly with time as a result of this international migration begins from the latter 19th century onwards with nation states turning to imperialist colonial expansion in order to develop their market and resources number c the development of ma- money economy and within it the concepts of capital or accumulated labor and the commodity use value that is the valuing of a thing in terms of what it can actually do for you is displaced by exchange value that is the valuing of a thing in terms of the amount of money it can be exchanged for capital the commodity and exchange value are said to introduce a sense of the abstraction of things and people from their actual context thus this happens to be a watershed when thought in context of the consumer culture that emerges in the modern period as a result of the shift from feudalism to capitalism there also happen changes in the nature of work 
the change is introduced first by the discipline of the factory and other industrial location and later by the development of the retail and service industries necessary for rapidly expanding market economies both involve the domination of the clock over preceding ways of organizing working life thus time clock and organization becomes important briefly from this transformation i think you can quite well get a glance of what we can understand as modern society and also of modernism think about the time narrative that you get in virginia woolf's mrs dalloway say for instance or references to industrialization that you see interfere with the narrative in dh lawrence the second important transitional point is the enlightenment it's second on account of its position in the time graph for in light of all matters it can be it can be considered of primary importance and so of an immanuel kant the name that is more like a synonym for enlightenment is referred to as the first real modernist enlightenment refers to an 18th century movement characterized by the belief in the emancipatory power of reason and logic over superstition and led to the formation of what we now largely take for granted as a scientific attitude to the world originating in the late 17th century thought of descartes the thought i think therefore i am and in the optics and physics of newton enlightenment frames the 18th century as an age in george rood's word of outstanding intellectual vigor I'll talk about intellectuals and modernism in one of my next videos which I believe you will be able to connect to enlightenment and the turn towards reason as a result of it. Here I'd also like to add a note that reason coming out of enlightenment at service or in combination with capitalism led to the instrumental treatment of the world as an object relatively passive or inert in comparison with the human subject. and as a resource to be exploited for the purposes of profit and the reflection of the same can be seen in modernism especially in modern art aesthetics and literature the third historical point or points that i'll be talking about brought a final break with the tradition ezra pound's 1934 injunction to make it new was the touchstone of the movement's approach so i believe you can understand the relevance as i say two years are important 1789 and 1848 you all have studied romantic literature by now so the year 1789 is a known year to you all it's the year of french revolution the french revolution led to overthrow of absolute monarchy and of the principle of the divine right of the kings and in the words of jeff wallace might be seen as the political corollary of enlightenment philosophy secular government was installed in france following the execution of king louis 16 in 1793 based on the democratic principles of liberty equality and fraternity and thus committed like the enlightenment to the ability of humans to take control of their own history freeing themselves from ignorance and superstition less familiar a dead than 1789 1848 was a year of uprising and revolution across europe distinguished by the emergence of working class or proletarian movements as the agents of political radicalism does emerge masses and the proletariat as defining categories this led to pro- proletarian modernism on one hand and also found an outlet in the modern art and on the other hand it led to the wider problems identified by literary mo- modernism in the form of a fundamental question of the age when i do not know the question is when i do not know any longer who are the we to whom i belong i do not know any longer who i am either i have not explained modernism its feature its features etc so i request if you are still confused regarding what we are doing watch the entire video and wait for the next where i'll discuss modernism in art and literature in detail somewhat things will fall in line and you will have a clear concept i believe now let's move on to the immediate events or more precisely let's peep into what the world order was like during the period along the eve along with the events that added or transformed modernism 
there are four important things that constituted the modern world. Number one, empire and colonialism were at its peak. Number two, technology had entered into lives and living in such a way that it had become a household term, but not yet as familiar as it is now. Number three, the consumer culture. And number four, the exploration and activism related to sex and gender on account of the newly emerged gender consciousness. If this constitutes the world, three important events added to the consciousness and philosophy, art and aesthetics that we can term as modernism today. They are First World War, the Bolshevik Revolution, Weimar Republic and the Bohas. Having said this, I will now point to the effects of these elements. We will begin with the world order. On account of the search for overseas market and raw materials, imperialist expansionism was at its vogue. The result was cultural exchange and ambivalent relationship emerging out of it. The artifact and ideas of peripheries of empire entered into culture as museum exhibits and epistemic objects. As museum objects, they were items of surprise, exotic exhibits. But along with this, growing interest led to epistemic interest as well and hence on one hand, the European culture were reassessed and the culture of the peripheries were also integrated. Experimental art that is at the heart of modernism has this cultural exchange also as a source. Remember the tattooing thing with which we began? So tattooing as a part of modern culture is a result of this cultural exchange. Technology and modern sounds like synonym to my ears. Even a layman can relate modernism to technology, right? I will just add an additional function to it and that is relating to literature. Technology has entered into modern life as invisible forces, as for instance electricity, x-rays, etc. As appliances for personalized use and application like television, phone, motor car and also as obtrusion into into the fabric of everyday life like streets, shops and were no longer confined into the industrial locations. Now technology was then not a very familiar part of life, rather it was the transitional phase towards familiarity. Three responses can be summed up relating to technology. First, discomfort. Second, hope. Third, rejection and fear. The discomfort resulted in the consciousness of technological intervention into literature and so the objective truth of technology was mixed with subjective experience. As for instance in Mrs. Dalloway there reads a line, Away and away the aeroplane shot till it was nothing but a bright spark, an aspiration, a concentration, a symbol. The hope related to technology resulted in utopic belief in technology as a means of progress which found an outlet in the experimental art of the period. When we'll be talking about the Bohas, then we'll be talking about this again. The third, that is rejection, led to literature that demonized technology in one hand, as for instance through science fiction, and on the other hand resulted in literature that glorified lost human values and hope for a soulful life. Check the slide cars, right? Vintage now, modern then. So these are Ford models and the first Model T Ford is actually a key symbolic moment of modernism. The question that you may have looming in your mind is why? With Ford, the cost power vehicle plummeted and thus it marks a shift from production to consumption and symbolizes the shaping of desires for new and inessential kinds of commodity and hence the beginning of consumer culture, the shopping culture that we have now. We go to a shopping mall and then buy clothes of different styles or those that we see in movies and it's not because we need them but because our desires have been commodified. This also marks the beginning of Ford's capitalism. In June 1914, Richard Ford doubled pay to $5 a day and cut ships from 9 hours to an 8 hour day for a 5 day work week. Ford attained international status in 1904 with the founding of Fords of Canada and it was in 1911 the company began to rapidly expand overseas with the opening of assembly parts plant sorry, 
in Ireland, England and France, followed by Denmark, Germany, Austria, Argentina. A factory was also opened in Japan in 1925 at Wokoma and also in South Africa in 1924 and also Australia in 1925 as subsidiaries of Ford of Canada due to preferential tariff rules for Commonwealth countries. By the end of 1919, Ford was producing 50% of all cars in the United States and 40% of all British ones. By 1920, half of all the cars in US were Model Ts due to its low price. Thus, to sum up, we have the new capitalism or Fordist capitalism with the features that you can see on the screen. Number one, economy that is increasingly an international system. Number two, emergence of monopolies and corporate organization instead of individual or family business. Number three, mass production for mass mar markets. The fourth point is the sex reform and gender relations. The period of artistic modernism coincides with the international movements of sex reform in the form of science of sexology. Moreover, the women's rights movement, which in the early 20th century took the form of feminist movement, was also there to reconstitute gender relations. Thus, we see a greater frankness in the artistic treatment of sexuality and bodily functions on one hand, and on the other hand, we also notice the rise of metropolitan modernist communities in which women writers could flourish in a context of relative equality and freedom and in which lesbian and gay sexuality was tolerated, celebrated and textualized. To complete the contextualization, we have the events left, but I'd like to stop here today. In my next video, which is going to be a continuation of this one, I'll talk about the events before joining the strings together and summing up modernism for you all. Hope you all found the content interesting. Thank you all for joining.